task force or a task group is a group of specially selected ships uh, designed to carry out a special task or mission. Now, in the case of Task Force 77, we have three attack carriers and supporting destroyers and cruisers. Admiral, the 8 o'clock surface now shows low-level convergence into the op area with the high steel building up in here and the weather. Well, we are all seamen here, and the uh, weather is of prime importance to us. Uh, to me, the commander, the daily weather briefing provides an indication as to what the men in this task force and the ships and planes are going to have to cope with in carrying out our mission. And we're all of us here living in ships, scattered over hundreds of miles at sea, doing one job and working together. This task force, the men of the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. Lieutenant Ernest Brazil speaking. And no matter how many uh, times you're catted off this uh, carrier, you just never get used to the feel of a, of a catapult shot. It's something that uh, can never grow old, something you can never become accustomed to. Uh, it's uh, somewhat akin to being hit in the chest by a Mack truck. Yet and still, it's a, it's a very fine feeling because you know everything's working properly and you're going to get off the end of the aircraft carrier flying. Those catapults out there are my responsibility, and without them, the Kitty Hawk is nothing but a hotel, floating hotel for 5,000 men. When you're on that flight deck, you got to have eyes in the back of your head. Once we get on the flight deck and start operating with the high noise level we have, we do most of our talking by hands and by lip movements. And just what you can see topside is only half of what is going on on this catapult. Uh, the people's below job, below decks are just as important as the people's topside. And it's just one big team all together. As you'll see, the flight deck crew hooking up the airplane, we have five men working together. And they have to work together or they're going to kill each other. I personally worked and trained all of my crew on the Kitty Hawk to my own satisfaction. In almost 100,000 aircraft shots, we have never put an airplane in the water on account of a malfunction of the catapult itself. Among the young crew of this floating city is a solid sprinkling of old timers. Commander Malcolm Guess is one. As a squadron executive officer, it's been my privilege an opportunity to observe these young pilots in action. We ask them to do more today than they ever were required to do at my lifetime at the stage of training the kids are going through. They continually, daily, are asked to do a terrific job, and they complete this job all on their own. I've been on a ship, of course, the thing that's always impressed me so much is the hidden talent, or the, you know, the guy that's off on the side that's doing a job that nobody ever really pays any attention to until he fails to do that job. And that's where I was referring to you about the, uh, using a very good example, since you actually can see it from standing up on the bridge of the chap. All he does every day is take a, a bunch of tow bars, and they're, they're not really light. They're made out of aluminum, good type of alloy and uh, put them on this cart, and all he does is pull them forward where they're available to put on an airplane. Well, the reason that his job's so important is you notice, as our airplanes land, they taxi forward, 
and they park them up on the bow. Well, they park them, and this is a, and they park them at about a 45 degree angle. They park there, and then as they pulled out, well, prior to being pulled out, of course, they're being gassed. And as soon as they're gassed, they want to be able to pull that airplane right out of that spot, pull it right aft as soon as recovery will with and park it. Well, they can't pull it aft unless the tow bar's on it. The object is to, is to catch a bunch of airplanes in a shorter period of time as you can and to launch a bunch of airplanes in as short a period of time as you have. Uh, they don't get the glory and the, and the uh, stuff of the other people out there on the flight deck where the action is, uh, where it's nice to watch. Boy, there goes an airplane. Look at that. Boy, isn't that dangerous? Uh, oh, you know, it, it catches the eye. These people don't catch the eye, but their job, in my opinion, is just as important as the, uh, as the people in the action. 310 Airborne. Airborne, 3-6. The Air Boss sits up on high, seeing it all happen. A carrier can launch scores of aircraft in less than an hour. Thousands of men hurry around the flight and hangar decks in apparent confusion. But there is no confusion. The Air Boss is boss. And his flight deck control center is a good symbol of the order woven into the wild hustle of a carrier vessel. Every aircraft has a place to be every second of an operation. A7's to starboard, whale on the point. Behind the carrier, it's plane guard destroyer, waiting in case the worst happens. If the worst doesn't happen, they throw in a dummy named Oscar and rehearse for it. That's their task in the task force, to wait, to be ready. Commander Bert Myatt, Jr., skipper, USS Black. Despite all the electronic equipment we have in this ship for this type of work, in the destroyer Navy, seamanship is still all important. This type of uh, work has special meaning to me in that I was an aviator myself one time. Uh, I went into the water off of, of a carrier on a dark night off uh, the coast of Korea. This was off Incheon the night before the Incheon invasion in September 1950. So I know how, I know how the fellas feel up there. And, uh, this is why we, we uh, put forth a little more effort uh, to do a real good job in this, this plane guarding work. They wait for months at a time, one man with a shark rifle, the sea and time flowing past them, while on the big buddy they're guarding, a continuous nonstop drama is being played. That is the carrier's task. All right, gents, don't forget uh, to use your pink code word cards for the day. Our dependency on other people starts right here in the ready room before a mission. We depend upon the uh, photo reconnaissance people who are going over the beach unarmed, take pictures of our targets, bring them back out here. They're developed, put into the computers. We have the people flying the electronic reconnaissance missions. They also get the same type of information, and this is all correlated together in the computers. And then our air intelligence people down at the other end of the ship correlate all this together, work out our missions for us, and we go down there and pick up this information that we need before we actually go out on a mission. We come down here to the ready room, and we have all this information right in front of us all laid out. Very neat. Okay, gents, uh, you've had the rundown on the target, and you've got the route, and how we're getting in there, a standard formation on the way down. Uh, once we get ready to make the turn in to go coast in, uh, We'll pick up a standard tactical formation, get it outspread nice and wide, and I'll call my throttle setting there, and we'll make our run in. Uh, remember to keep the bird moving. Hadn't been a lot of fire, but uh, we don't want to take any chances on it. OK, when we're ready for our mission, we start off by putting on right around 70 pounds worth of flight gear. The survival vest carries your radio, your flares, your dye marker, your survival kit, a small medical kit, water bottles. These are all the things that you really need to survive if you're going to be down in the jungle for any length of time. Of course, you strap on a 38 caliber pistol on your hip and you're ready to go on up to the flight deck and get out there and do it. We actually wear so much gear that at times you, you have the appearance of a big old teddy bear. You pretty well waddle up to the airplane and at some point in the future, I think you can foresee a, a Derek to just pick up a pilot and sit him in the cockpit. The largest carrier is no more than a moving patch in a heaving liquid void. The landing signal officer, the LSO, is therefore an indispensable man. 
see it. You give me the choice between the, one of the richest insurance policies that you can give me or give me a good LSO. I'll take the LSO any day. A middle ear once in a while, you're going to have what we call a hairy one or, boy, that's a wild one type pass. Uh, knock that off. Don't do it again type thing. Uh, this occurs periodically, but it's, it's nothing you accept. It's something you try to correct. The LSO picks him up approximately three quarters of a mile. Recovery complete. Recovery complete. The carriers of the task force are bound to their supporting ships by the commander's will and a network of electromagnetic signals. The purely human bond is the logistics helicopter. Commander Donald Garrett. As a log helo pilot, I see a great deal of Task Force 77. As a matter of fact, I think I see more of it than anybody else on a day-to-day -day basis. We fly from carrier to carrier and from ship to ship, all within Task Force 77. Some of our people out there go for, they used to go for weeks, for months without mail. But one of the most important things to, I would say, the average sailor out there now, uh, when it comes to the log helo, is the daily mail. The ships uh, that we live on out here come and go, however we stay. You might say we're nomads, nomads of the Tonkin Gulf. We are uh, the only airline that I know of that uh, has to deliver people to their destination while we're still flying. And uh, we get to see them all. We get to know their personalities. And the ships do have personalities, just like people. The log helo gives a little and takes a little. Refueling on the fly makes every little ship a filling station in the China Sea. The landing pad on USS Stanley is at the very tip of the task force's perimeter, more than 100 miles north of Kitty Hawk. Stanley, a three-year-old frigate, is the picket ship, the task force's advance warning ship and advance guard. Captain William M. A. Green commands. Mr. Jeanette, bring the ship to 25 knots. Aye, sir. All engines ahead, flank indicate 175 RPM for 25 knots. Captain Green. Stanley is uh, a ship of less than three years old. She has invested in her from the people of the United States $100 million worth of ship and uh, $200 million worth of ship's company. Stanley, in her uh, position, does the pirate ship, is the eyes of the Seventh Fleet which means she's the furthest north in the Tonkin Gulf and uh, has the ability to detect whether or not a hostile uh, aircraft or surface vessel might be approaching the Seventh Fleet forces. This ship's company is uh, made up of a, what we call the top drawer variety of the new breed of people. They are highly skilled and trained in, in electronics which is awfully important to the concept of present-day warfare. Sophisticated Stanley may be, but she still needs the hands of a seaman. Bosun's mate, second class, Richard Handley. As modern as this ship is, there's two rates that she cannot do without. That's her bosun mates and her engineering department. As bosun mates, we handle the ship as they handled ships of old, with lines and all sorts of associated equipment. The two that work together the closest are your bosun mates and your engineers. Your engineers keep the ship running, they keep us with fresh water, they keep us with fuel, and they supply the speed. We, as bosun mates, keep the ship maintenance-wise up to par, keep all of our up topside areas up to date with, with gear, and keep everything running and working in working order. 
We handle everything such as refueling and high lines. A fleet of supply vessels, a task force in itself, mothers the ships on station. UNREP, underway replenishment, sees to it that no ship falls short of anything it needs. The two ships steam side by side as fuel goes into Stanley's tanks. On the signal bridge, a brisk trade goes on in movies. Old, new, any movie you haven't seen lately. There are many ways to board a ship, some of them not very interesting, some of them a bit too interesting. Arriving by High Line is in the second classification. Stanley's escort destroyer, USS Porterfield, has come alongside to pick up a medical officer for a routine visit. It is the doctor's first voyage in the bosun's chair. Stanley has another visitor, a Russian trawler, Captain Green. Trawler, the uh, Gidrafon, is the present one in the Gulf. She'll be on station for some time, we suppose. And uh, it looks like an array of electronics, antennas, and uh, transmission equipment. Soviet defense ships that position themselves in the talking Gulf among our naval forces have a right to be here. This is international waters. Our guidelines are pretty much to uh, be alert to him, but not to interfere, of course, with his operations. Same time, not to let him interfere with our operations. I want to keep the uh, Soviet trawler Gifford from the port just for uh, meanest. Uh, he's been trying to maneuver around to see our starboard side, and uh, really, I don't know what he'll gain, but uh, we'll keep him interested anyhow by uh, if I continue to pass him to port as he stays around my area of operation here. Stanley is full of devices that might interest Soviet intelligence. Her combat intelligence center has the job of alerting the entire task force to any hint of threat. Captain Green. It's a, it's a time of uh, quick response now, a matter of seconds. That is the atmosphere in which the commanding officer of a ship of this uh, sophistication uh, operates. You know, you might ask me, uh, what level do you stop letting people make their decisions or use their judgment? We don't stop at any level. We even have uh, petty officers of the Blue Jacket, first class and second class petty officers, who communicate back and forth with other ships without ever consulting me before they communicate or consulting the evaluator. They've got to in order to keep, we say, real-time information flowing. I am turning control over console number three. Radar man first class, Arthur Russell. This is the Bar Camp Barrier Combat Air Patrol, the first line of defense for Task Force 77. We are providing control, much the same as around a civilian airport, with one important exception. MIG air bases are approximately 30 miles north of this aircraft. And any time they may venture out. If they did, it would be my job to vector the bar cap into a position to meet the incoming raids. Uh, I'm working with these pilots every day. Pretty soon it gets to be on a first name basis, and uh, then eventually it leads up to a nickname basis. The pilots uh, and the controllers uh, all have nicknames. Uh, some of them are very descriptive, such as the Hawk, uh, Happy. And, uh, I acquired the uh, nickname of the Bear initially, and after a period of time, it was uh, shortened even further to the uh, Teddy Bear. I'm known as the uh, Teddy Bear of the Talking Gulf. 
The, uh, these Barcap pilots are the world's greatest. It's often difficult uh, sitting down here, uh, watching a couple of pips on a scope, and, uh, especially after getting to know several of them personally after visits to the carrier. And then all of a sudden, you have a uh, pip disappear on you. It's a very uh, shattering experience uh, every time we uh, lose one, and particularly when you know someone personally. Just about a week ago, Ernie and I had a little incident where we had a double engine flame out. We had to eject from the aircraft. We were about halfway down to Da Nang. We had another F-4 on our wing. Of course, he was right there to make all the radio broadcasts. We were in the parachutes, and we hit the water. And uh, one of the first things I did was to pull out my little personal survival radius. As soon as we got in the water, I was in full contact with the, uh, the other aircraft at all times. Right, just to prove uh, how quick these people did work and how well their teamwork was, we were in the water. From the time we jumped out of the airplane to the time we were on board the helicopter on our way to the USS Horner, it was a total of, I'd figure, less than 25 minutes. task force is a collection of men and ships at sea. And the sea is full of wind and rain and weather and days and weeks and months passing. Many Americans no longer think of themselves as a seafaring people. The prairies, the mountains, the wilderness are more our historic images. Yet, Leif Erikson, Columbus, the pilgrims, the great waves of immigrants came by sea. And Americans fought the most decisive battles in history in the Pacific. One of our greatest stories, Moby Dick, is about the sea. And today we are still farers of the sea. This is a stand-down day out here on Yankee Station. This is the first one we've had this cruise. Stand-down day is a 24-hour period when we get a chance to relax. There are no flight ops for this time. Of course, they always have to have a fighter manned up. And unfortunately, today, Ernie and I drew the alert. So here we are, while everybody else is down relaxing, we're up here on our airplane, just in case we have to be launched, in case we're ever intercepted out here. to Sunday, I just got a letter from you, so I figured I'd write home and let you know what's happening. We're sitting out here off the coast of Vietnam. Now, here's a tradition that probably did not come down from the old days of wooden ships and iron men. The catapult officer has ended his tour of sea duty, and he's going home, but not before he commands one more launch from the deck of Kitty Hawk. As the days turn into months, it is easy to forget the perils of the sea. A man coming too close to a jet exhaust has been blown over the side. 5,000 shipmates wait, each suddenly aware of his own mortality. Here is the young sailor saved from the sea. When I was falling, I didn't have much time to think trivial thoughts. As the ship went past me, I was spotted by one of the watches, and a smoke pot was thrown in the water. I was only in the water for about 10 minutes after the fantail of the ship passed me when a motor whale boat off the USS Robinson picked me up. I came back on board the ship, landed in the heeler that picked me up off the destroyer. I looked out the door, the first thing I saw was 
all of the cat crew that the cat officer would let come over, the men that weren't actually involved in the launch at the time. It was a real good feeling to know that so many of my friends had turned out to see me come back on the ship. Admiral Cousins. You have a mixture here of old pros and uh, but, uh, a large part, perhaps 75% or more, are, are men and uh, young officers who were on their first combat tour, their first uh, enlistment in the Navy in the case of the men. Nevertheless, it's always gratifying to me and I think surprising to many people to see how the young men pitch in, take their share of responsibility. The young fellows who last year were on a high school football team or working at a gas station this year out here have a vital part in this team. Whether they're down in the engine room on working on a, in a shaft alley or, or tending a boiler, or up uh, working on the arresting gear on the flight deck. They're all in a responsible place, and for many guys, it's the most responsibility they'll ever have. Captain Green of the Stanley. But I believe this is uh, a fairly good summary of uh, commitment to calls. And we have a, uh, in Navy ships, a commonality of calls, a commonality of purpose. I don't believe any other profession can really say that. Uh, everybody has an objective purpose, an objective uh, for which they are, which they stand and which they are uh, destined. But I believe in the Navy ships, even like, unlike other military forces, there is a, a, a commonality of purpose, a, a camaraderie uh, that I can't believe others can develop. But again, it's when you say shipmate and, uh, and a ship's mission, they, are, they fit hand in hand. And I think we will usually go in without without holding back one, one little bit of our effort, individually and as a crew. A collection of men in ships and planes. Young men and old pros. Shipmates a long way from home. A task force of the United States Navy. Mm -hmm.